um, speaker series. Today's uh, uh, keynote speaker will be from Vyosa Osmani. Um, Vyosa has a um, practitioner and scholarly um, experience uh, in constitutional law and today's uh, um, topic will be uh, looking at the constitutional design and uh, how constitutional design actually provides for stability in fragile or new states through the case study of Kosovo. Uh, Yosa will, will attempt to bring us today um, compare, uh, uh, let's say, an approach between theory and practice, given her long experience um, with the Constitutional Court. Uh, Yosa has been quite active in um, um, having cases in the Constitutional Court of Kosovo. She also served as a um, uh, senior advisor for legal and international affairs uh, the Office of the President of Kosovo and currently serves as a um, member of the parliament. So uh, let us welcome Yosa today. And, uh, thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be part of um, what I think is a great initiative of the Public Policy and Governance Unit. Um, President Sell, uh, colleagues, thank you for finding the time, but most of all, thank you students who are bearing with me four times a week and have found, find, found the time to bear with me also on a Friday. I know. It's not a favorite thing to do uh, right before the weekend. Um, the topic that have, has been chosen by uh, Lorena and other colleagues in, in the unit um, used to be quite a challenging topic for me for quite a while to speak, but uh, not anymore probably because of all of the questions that I get from the students in my constitutional law class. So I have already told you about much of the background <laughs> Uh, or what happened behind the scene with respect to drafting of the Constitution of Kosovo. Uh, but to clarify, I was not always talking to an audience such as the one today, because I know that there are lots of you colleagues that, um, although have been in Kosovo for quite a while and have read from the papers uh, on these processes, it will be a pleasure to share uh, some of, at least my views, on what has gone on. I have to clarify uh, at the outset that today I do not represent the views of my political party nor especially not the views of the parliament when speaking on these issues. These are my purely personal views on uh, the constitution drafting process. Uh, when talking about a constitution there are people who look at the text from a strictly technical and legal point of view, especially us lawyers love to do that. Uh, but when you have been in the process and you've seen how it was drafted, uh, you cannot help it but think of the scenes when that text was drafted, of all the fights over that single word, which looks really simple right now, of all the debates between political representatives uh, that sometimes were really exaggerated, and especially the influence of the international representatives who were present at the time when the Constitution was drafted. Uh, however, as you've heard many times by now, while a constitution represents a country's uh, highest legal act, it's not only such, it's also its highest political normative act. The constitution simply enshrines the political interests in a legal text. At least that was true in the case of Kosovo. Uh, because, of course, certain developed countries where the level of democracy is not what we're used to see here in Kosovo, uh, do not look at the text, as I said, from a strictly legal point of view. They don't evaluate it only as a legal document. So in those countries, while political interests do have an influence, <coughs> it is different political interests because they are seen from a historical background as well. Mainly the principle of lessons learned really comes into play. This however, is not the question in countries that go uh, through transition processes. Uh, when talking about Kosovo, of course, Kosovo has not only gone through one transition process. We've had the transition from 1999 to building institutions from scratch, but they were institutions with no powers, with no functions. And then another transition process, institutions with no powers to institutions <coughs> of an independent country. A third transition process came with institutions of in, an independent country with some limited powers and an international supervision to institutions with fuller powers but still with an international presence 
such as ULEX, of which you hear every day in the news, with some executive powers, especially in the area of justice and police. But Kosovo is not simply a country with transition processes. It's not just the transition that has had an influence in the way how the Constitution looks today. We've had other factors, of which I'm going to speak in a while, that have had a determining influence in the text of the Constitution. But again, going back to the daily political influence, <coughs> Kosovo is a typical place where you can notice what we lawyers love to call ad hominem factor. It's the human factor, the interest of the political <coughs> players, those who were in power at that moment, those who were leading the institutions, who were leading the political processes, and who were involved in the Constitutional Committee. Uh, as I said, from a constitutional point of view, Kosovo is quite a unique case. We love to call it sui generis from an international point of view, but it's sui generis in all aspects. There are a couple of factors, as, as I said, that we have to keep in mind, starting with the Ahtisari proposal. Uh, Ahtisari, for some, quite a hero for a while, for some, not a very a uh, powerful or loved name. Uh, the former president of Finland, uh, quite an influential political figure that has had uh, an interesting role in Kosovo's state building process. As you know, it is a document that stems from the negotiation process for the Kosovo's st final status. The second factor that we have to keep in mind with respect to Kosovo's constitutional building is the Declaration of Independence. Many people think of the Declaration of Independence simply as a document enshrining the political will of the people. In Kosovo's case, is much more than that. I'll get back to that. Thirdly, and what I'm going to focus most today, is the agreement, a political agreement, during, between the leaders of that time called the Power Sharing Agreement. This agreement has never been published. It's a simple one-page document. I have it somewhere in my file. I couldn't find it. I'm not a very organized person. Otherwise, I would have shared it with you today. <laughs> it's a one-page document with three columns and with lots of rows. My constitutional law students would remember when we did the Power Sharing exercise, right? That's exactly how it happened with the leaders. The three main leaders of the three main institutions, the president, the PM, and the president, or the speaker of the assembly, sat together with the presence of guess who? The US Embassy, of course, to divide the powers that would later on be envisaged in the Constitution. Because the body whose job was to draft the Constitution faced the deadline. They couldn't decide by themselves, I'm talking about the Constitutional Committee, what power belongs to whom. So they had to go back to the political leaders and ask them whether they have an agreement on how to share these powers. Uh, that was not a very easy exercise. The leaders did have to sit. They represented different political parties, different political interests, different backgrounds. Some thought that the president should be more powerful. Some thought that the prime minister, the executive, should be more powerful. Some thought that since Kosovo is a country under transition, we need to empower the legislative, the assembly. Because most countries that undergo such processes normally have a very strong parliament. Because it, after all, it's a body with 120 people, and it, it's more democratic to have that body control the other institutions. So there was lots of negotiation in that small table in the president's office in order to draft that one-page document, which was changed about probably 12 to 13 times. I'm not sure whether it was the 13th draft that was the final draft that was later on sent to the Constitutional Committee. The draft showed the first column called the president, the second column called the Prime Minister, and the third column called the Parliament. And then in the rows, you would have each competence. For example, foreign policy, 
and then a tick, whether it's a competence of the president or whether it's a competence of the prime minister or of the assembly. In some cases, of course, you would have shared competences. Whether that was the best practical decision, that's another question. But in the case of foreign policy, it's quite interesting. The Constitution says that the president of the republic leads Kosovo's foreign policy. But then, when checking the chapter in the government, it says that the government leads the foreign, exercises the foreign policy. So there were quite a lot of problems in practice, especially since the government at that time was led by a prime minister from a different party and the president was from a different party. The president thought that he was the boss in foreign policy. The prime minister didn't care. He was just going on and doing his own foreign policy visits. So there was a need, of course, after a while, after the Constitution was drafted, to see whether we need to reshape or change this power-sharing agreement, especially in those cases when it was not functioning in practice. The fourth factor, the least important one, is the intention of the drafters, the people who actually <coughs> drafted the Constitution. Uh, a bunch of lawyers and political representatives that we're in the Constitutional Committee. I've had the chance to represent the President in that committee, but then participated in the working groups, because it was the working groups that drafted the text. And the most important group was, of course, the one in the power sharing. Uh, because the rest were, what, groups on human rights, groups on economy, uh, groups on judiciary, and other areas. Now, why would the job of these other areas be easier? Well, to the most extent, because it was a copy-paste exercise from them. And guess from where? Of course, from the Akhtisari proposal. The Akhtisari proposal as a document, uh, it's quite a voluminous document, to be honest. It's quite hard to read it. It has quite many provisions, most of which dealing with the rights and privileges of minority communities. One, and secondly, dealing with the decentralization process. But it does have a chapter which is called Constitutional Provisions because Ahtisari's aim was to make sure that even if the leaders of Kosovo when declaring the independence would bypass some of the requirements in Ahtisari, they at least should not escape what was called the Constitutional Provisions. They had to be taken from Ahtisari and put in the Constitution as is, without any change. And they were. Uh, of course, as most of you know, our Constitution now has a specific chapter dealing with the rights of communities and then a specific chapter dealing with uh, decentralization. Uh, again, it's a different question whether this has really functioned because there are different areas in Kosovo where it has worked better and some areas where it has not worked at all, such as the north of Kosovo. Uh, one other specific element was that when we <laughs> adopted the Constitution, with two-thirds majority in the parliament, despite of the fact that in every other normal country such a constitution which would be the number one act of a country, it was not in Kosovo. The constitution itself said that if there are discrepancies or differences between the constitution and the Ahtisari proposal, the latter would prevail. This was extremely unique for a country that calls itself independent and strived to build independent institutions. And it was, of course, the job of what we until recently had here as the International Civilian Office to oversee whether there are such discrepancies. <laughs> Luckily for the institutions of Kosovo, I believe, the International Civilian Representative never used its executive powers like the International Civilian Representative in Bosnia did. Uh, you've probably heard, at least in the news, that the international representative in Bosnia in many cases repealed, annulled the decisions of the institutions of Bosnia. In Kosovo, Peter Fight, although he had that power, he never used it. Uh, whether there was influence and interference behind closed doors, of course there was, although not as much as I would expect. Um, there were also cases when, despite of the influence and the interference, the answer of Kosovo institutions would not change. So we were very lucky to have 
uh, a person like Peter Feit, who despite of never, of in many cases, not being happy with what the Kosovo institutions did, he never intervened. Internationally speaking, from the point of view of international affairs, that would not have been seen as a good act for Kosovo's state building process. If other countries would have noticed that we have an international institution that can quash, that can completely destroy our decisions, it of course means that we are still not an independent country and that the state building has not been concluded as a process. So it's good that this has not happened. Uh, moreover, uh, you've heard recently, September 2012, uh, that despite of some areas of the Akisara proposal not being completely fulfilled, we've had the process of ending supervised independence. Uh, while Kosovo was declared as an independent country with international supervision, uh, in our contacts with countries that have not recognized Kosovo, there were many countries that were stating that they are waiting to recognize until international supervision is removed. It was quite a clear message because they didn't think that we are an independent and sovereign country as long as we have that, that, we have that supervision from the international powers. So that's why it was a crucial historic moment for Kosovo when on the 10th of September the supervised independence was ended with uh, a final vote in the Parliament of Kosovo. Of course, such ending of such a process does not also mean that all the executive powers of international factors in Kosovo have left. The Constitution of Kosovo, if you read it, never speaks of ULEX. ULEX is not mentioned anywhere, never was. Because at the beginning, when we drafted the Constitution, those who had mandated ULEX was the European Commission were not in favor of Kosovo's independence, meaning they were status neutral, so they thought that if they become a part of a constitution of an independent country, then they would not be status neutral anymore. So they did not want to become part of that constitution. But now, when we ended supervised independence, ULEX started to insist that they should enter the constitution, but for different purposes. The reason why they now wanted to enter the Constitution is because, uh, as it is the case with many international bodies serving in either peacekeeping or uh, other operations, uh, there is a virus that goes into them. And they simply either get addicted to the place or to the nice neighborhoods or to the nice salaries that they have. And Kosovo is not a dangerous country, as we know. It's not Afghanistan, it's not Iraq. So why should they go there instead of staying in Kosovo? So they thought if they become a part of the Constitution, they would definitely uh, be there for a long time. And you know what? Because we cannot change the Constitution only with the two-thirds of Albanian votes, the 100 votes. We need what we call a double majority, meaning both the Albanian majority and the minorities have to vote. And each of these groups in the parliament has to give their two-thirds of votes to make any change in the constitution, even if it's a grammatical mistake or error. So they wanted to enter the constitution with some vague language that would stay, say, state that they are status neutral, but stay there uh, and have their commodity, and only when they want to, they would talk to both the Albanian majority and the minority communities and get removed from there. Of course, we didn't uh, complete that wish, uh, so ULEX is not a part of the Constitution, but it did take its mandate from a specific act of the Parliament. Uh, as you know, currently, there is an amendment process going on, some amendments to the Constitution have already been made, uh, although if you search for the Constitution uh, uh, on Google, you will probably get the, latest, uh, the previous version, not the latest version. We had to amend the Constitution in order to end supervised independence uh, because there was a chapter called Provisional Norms, which was giving powers, of course, to the International Civilian Office, and we needed to delete all that powers. 
but secondly is the process that deals with the constitutional and electoral reform. All of the constitutional amendments have been drafted, they are just sitting there in the drawers of the political leaders because there still needs to be a political agreement. So it all comes down to, as I said before, ad hominem, a hominem effect, the human effect, the political interest, the daily political interest when drafting a constitution, uh, especially in a country like Kosovo. Unfortunately, I believe we're going to see these kind of situations for quite a while. We're going to see how the opinions of certain political factors on how Kosovo should look become constitutionally binding norms, which opinions not necessarily look at the historical backgrounds and especially not lessons learned. Because if they had, the competences or the power sharing agreement would have looked completely different. If we really cared about how Kosovo can function best, we would have left the job to constitutional experts, people who can study the systems, people who can really what works, who can see what works in a country like Kosovo, taking into account, of course, also the specific circumstances in the country, not simply what a certain leaders want to have as his powers when he becomes the president or what one guy wants to have has his powers when he becomes the prime minister. Uh, as long as such interests prevail in drafting the constitution, because we, we will never be able to completely delete them or disregard them, but as long as they prevail, we, I believe, we are not going to have a constitution uh, that, that at least has an effect in a functional, in creating a functional state. Uh, there are lots of things that I'd like to say, but I think I should leave sure. space for the questions. You're, you've got a very interesting discussion of the, some of the uh, unusual features of the Kosovo Constitution, international involvement, uh, uh, qualified majorities, etc. Uh, how much does that affect, the, you think, the, the legitimacy of the Constitution in the eyes of the people of, of, of Kosovo? Do they accept this as, as their Constitution more or less once and for all, or uh, do they still think of it as a provisional document? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, of course, intentionally, from my side, the very first uh, topic that I always discuss with my constitutional law students is whether the Constitution represents the will of the people, whether they really think of it as their document. Because when one reads the preamble of the Constitution, it starts with the words, we, the people of the Republic of Kosovo. So, of course, I always ask them, the first assignment is for them to draft their own preamble how would they want to see it? And trust me, it's completely different from what we see in the preamble of the current constitution. Um, the people, although they have participated in public discussions while the constitution was drafted, uh, because they did uh, take place even here at AUK, uh, if I'm not mistaken, at other universities in all municipalities of Kosovo, still did not feel that this was a document that represented their will. I believe this is primarily because most of the text of the Constitution stems from the Akhisari proposal. So they felt that even if they had expressed their opinion in these public opinions, in these public gatherings, uh, still it would not be taken into account because it was already a done deal. Uh, because the deal had been negotiated and it was already, according to them, a part of the Constitution. But there were still lots of things that they could have changed with their ideas. I know there were quite some that we had taken into account, either views that were sent by email or other stuff. Uh, but I believe that there's one specific chapter with which most of the people in Kosovo feel very, uh, have a feeling of ownership, and that's the chapter on human rights and fundamental freedoms. It's a very effective chapter, probably one of the very best chapters all, both well drafted uh, in the sense of technicalities and legal stuff, but also in the sense of protecting human rights in the most effective ways. Uh, you cannot see that in most European countries. And also in the quoting Marty Atisari, Kosovo Constitution gives individuals, but also minority communities, rights that no other country in Europe does. It's just up to the people to use them. But there's also the problem
problem of awareness, how much the people are aware of what the Constitution actually says. Uh, once they get aware of everything that is provided, either rights or remedies, then they get to love it more than they have uh, so far. But I believe it was the Atisari process that made most of the people think that there's no feeling of ownership. And of um, constitutions becoming so well established, and honestly, you know, they're always changing. But sort of, what do you think in terms of years? I'm just thinking compared perhaps with the United States Constitution. Mm -hmm. So sort of in the US, how many years do you, would you say it took before it became sort of established? Obviously, it doesn't happen overnight. Right? It really depends on the circumstances of each country, but also their legal system. There are quite many differences between the US system and Kosovo system, the common law and the civil law system as we know it. Uh, in the US, it's, it's also quite a current topic with my students, that's why they're smiling, because they know all the answers already. Uh, uh, it's, we discussed about it, I think, yes, uh, two or three days ago. In the United States, we have a constitution with seven articles and then the, the amendments. But the, cons the US Constitution, it's not just what you see in those articles, it's also what the US Supreme Court says about those articles. And if you read what the US Supreme Court has said about those articles, you wouldn't recognize many of those words because it evaluated, it, it ought, lots of changes were made, of course, taking into account changes in history, the civil rights movement, even technology. Uh, so uh, in the case of Kosovo, it's, it's different uh, because it's too early to know whether after, let's say, five or ten years, our system as such will change. Uh, I believe that in terms of uh, fundamental human rights and freedoms, it is a chapter that will resist time. It is a chapter that will definitely resist even changes in the government and will resist even changes in governmental systems. But in terms of other chapters speaking with, about power sharing, about uh, economy and others, it really depends on politics quite a lot. Uh, but how many years would it take? It depends on uh, the text of the Constitution. If we go for a Constitution which only uh, has norms from a general point of view, which then you can interpret and add legislation, then it can resist time for longer. But if you have a Constitution which is detailed, such as ours, uh, that forces each and every as almost each and every aspect of life, of course you're going to have to change it very often because you cannot go just with changing uh, pieces of legislation and with changing codes and statu statutes. You would have to go to the cons back to the Constitution. Uh, so I guess it to answer your question, uh, it does depend on the system and it depends on the Constitution. Uh, ours will need to change. Uh, not just because the society and the state building process is not being concluded, but also the text of the Constitution is such that it will require changes for even small issues. For example, very soon we're planning to add amnesty, um, which is additional to individual pardon for people who are in prison. So only for that we're going we're to need to go through a constitutional amendment process. Whereas for constitutions that have only a few articles, you don't need to change it very often because they are very general in nature. I hope it answers your question. Uh, my question is whether, can you tell us a little bit more on the reserve and guaranteed seats for the communities sitting in the parliament and how that is going to change the new proposal that uh, the Constitution Committee has proposed? Uh, that was actually one of the things that I was planning to, to discuss and I forgot about it. Our Constitution provides for guaranteed and reserved seats in the Parliament. Um, also for seats in the government. Uh, a certain number of ministries always has to belong to minority community parties. Uh, but with respect to the Parliament so far, the minority communities had 20 reserved seats. And then if they would participate in the elections, they would also get, whatever votes they get, they would get seats extra from those 20. For the moment, they have 25 in the parliament of Kosovo. Uh, but this was going to be applicable only for the two mandates of the parliament of Kosovo, starting from the moment when the constitution was adopted. The two mandates will be completed in 2014, unless we have early elections. Uh, so let's assume that the elections will happen in 2014. 
From that moment, for the third mandate and on, the minority communities would only have guaranteed, only would have reserved seats, meaning they would only have the 20. Even if they participate in the elections, and let's say they get 13 altogether, then everything that can be added to them is just the other seven, meaning the total cannot exceed 20 seats. Uh, there is, however, a movement now, a new initiative from the minority communities. They are insisting that we should amend the Constitution in a way that would give them both guaranteed and reserved seats forever. Not just for the first two mandates that would be finished in 2014, but forever. Um, of course, uh, many people have said no. I was the very first person to say that that is really undemocratic. There are at least four decisions of the European Court of Human Rights that have found that there are human rights violations. If you reserve a seat for someone who, got, who didn't get votes and you keep a member of parliament who got votes out of the parliament, uh, so we have to follow those decisions because it's a constitutional obligation for us. Uh, so 20 seats for the minority communities in Kosovo are more than enough if we compare it to the percentage that they have in the population, which is much less than 20. It's about 10% according to the latest statistics, 10 to 12, uh, although there was no registration in some parts of Kosovo. Uh, so there is a movement, there is an initiative. Uh, the minority communities have said that they will not participate in any other amendment of the Constitution if we do not complete their request. So it's quite a threat. <laughs> uh, because they know that it's quite hard, as I said, to, to change our Constitution. It requires a double majority, votes both from the Albanians and the Serbs. We will see what the next couple of months bring. Probably this will become quite a hot topic uh, now with the uh, municipal elections in 2013 because every time there are elections people try to negotiate uh, requests uh, but we haven't seen very clear answers from any political party so far it's just been individuals giving their opinion uh, on whether they think it's a good idea to give these seats to them forever or not maybe a comment about the scope of the constitution is pretty broad here yes. compared to one like the United States do you think it would be better Say something about how it affects governance in general. Uh, I do believe that it would have been better uh, because, firstly, you wouldn't need to go through a constitutional amendment process for every tiny detail. But it was impossible for that at that time because, as I said, Akhtisari envisaged uh, quite many provisions that had to be part of the constitution because uh, he and his team wanted to make sure that they give the highest protection possible to the rights of minority communities and they wanted to make sure that the, the decentralization process gets a constitutional character rather than just being in a law. Uh, now there's another reason, as I said, why they wanted to have most of these provisions in detail in the Constitution and that's because they knew we cannot change them very easily, at least not without the influence of the international community as the situation stands right now. If, it, if most of these issues were in laws, then we can change laws, most of them, with a simple majority. Because there's a group of uh, legislation that is called legislation of vital interest, which requires uh, a, what we call a qualified majority, plus you cannot change them through a referendum. So it's, it's a group of laws that is quite hard <coughs> to change, but not as hard as the Constitution. Uh, how would it affect governance? Well, one would think if we had a government that really cares about what the Constitution says and goes by the Constitution, works by the Constitution, uh, then it is important to have everything in the Constitution because it would stop the government from not acting in accordance to it. But uh, having a government that doesn't really care whether it's in the Constitution or whether it's in the laws makes it irrelevant for the moment. So I believe at, at least as the situation stands right now, it would have been it, it would not have been that important if most of these provisions would have been in the legislation. Would have been the same. And I personally believe that it's better for any country, not just Kosovo, to have a constitution that is more narrow in its scope. Because you don't have to change it every year, you don't have to fight for votes to change it. And it's easier because it depends on the circumstance and sometimes because, as I said, just because of technology developments, you have to change laws. 
one last follow up. And, um, how do you think that, that requirement that it has to be changed so often that's going to affect the long term legitimacy, public legitimacy of, or, you know, of, of, of the, the requirement to change the constitution? The fact that it has to be changed so often, how, how do you think that will affect in the long run the view of the constitution as a legitimate document? Uh, I think it does affect it. Uh, people laugh about it. <laughs> they think, ah, uh, you're, you're changing it so often, it means it was not drafted well at the very beginning. Uh, whereas, as I said at the beginning, it, it has nothing to deal with the way how it was drafted. It has to deal with daily political interests uh, of the parties who are in power and those who have votes uh, in the political spectrum. Uh, so among the people, it does affect its legitimacy. I, I think it even, uh, it, it hurts even more uh, the lack of the feeling of ownership that I, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, in the United States, if you would even ask a schoolboy to change their constitution, at, at least from my experience, you know, they don't want to hear about it. They, they think of it as something uh, that should not be changed. And, and I think it will take time until we have that very same feeling here in Kosovo. Uh, but first and foremost, we need to feel that it's our constitution. We have to get the people more involved, not only through public discussion, but by also convincing them that this is a document where Kosovo institutions had their say. It's not an imposed document. Currently, the feeling is that it's an imposed document. I'm sorry. I I, that's, at least that's my feeling if you disagree. I have one more last follow. Is it possible to remove some of that stuff from the Constitution and just make it more? I mean, is that even feasible or not? Yes, it is possible as long as uh, you can get the votes in the parliament. Uh, for example, one of the things that I proposed when we were talking about this electoral reform was to remove, uh, there, was, there is a chapter on elections, and it tells us how Kosovo is only one electoral zone, how there are open or closed lists, how do you vote, and all that stuff. You don't need to have that in the constitution. That's normally mm -hmm. part of the electoral code in most other countries in the world. Because we should not allow to change the constitution every time we have new elections. Because with every election process, people are blaming the electoral code and the electoral provisions, like it was their fault. Of course, it's not in Kosovo. Uh, but then they say, okay, the elections were gone wrong, now let's change the constitution. We should not allow for those changes to happen that, ha to, to happen that ver very often. So in order to do that, we need to make sure that these issues are removed in the law, and it's much easier to change the law than it is the Constitution. There are definitely lots of such things that we should remove and, and make them as part of legislation rather than the Constitution. Since you just mentioned now the, the election reform that's taking place in Kosovo, if I'm not wrong, at the same time there was a president, uh, constitutional committee that yes. was established to make amendments mm -hmm. to the Constitution that was going to look at the presidential at of the president. Yes. How has that proceeded? Um, that was completed a long time ago, but uh, it was completed in the sense that the constitution, uh, the constitutional amendments provided for a new presidential election system, meaning the president would now be directly elected by the people, not by the parliament, which by the way was the number one request in all public discussions that we had with the citizens in 2007 when the constitution was designed. Uh, the citizens were not listened to. Uh, of course, now the political parties understand that it's important to have a president elected by, by the people, but they change their mind very often, so it's, it's hard even to say. Uh, secondly, we've changed the competences of the president in a way that would, we would avoid clashes of competences. Earlier I mentioned there are lots of areas where both the PM and the president jointly act. Uh, in practice, that has shown to be quite a big mistake, so we had to make sure that we clear that up. What belongs to the president belongs to the president. What belongs to the prime minister belongs so to the prime minister. So there has been improvements. So everything, yeah, everything has been finished. All the amendments are ready. Uh, but as you know, there was a political agreement which required for uh, early presidential elections. Now there are some political parties who do not want early political elections, so it's quite a complicated political mess. But, but uh, with regards to the Constitutional Committee, its mandate is finished because it has prepared all the amendments. Now it belongs to the political parties to make sure that they are voted 
or not voted. And in do the you parliament. believe that these amendments will make the balance of the three powers that you, now with the president having most of them? Uh, most of them. I personally believe that there are three amendments over there which should not be part of the constitution. Uh, one of them gives the president power to return names of the judges for the constitutional court. The president should not be given that power because the constitutional court is the only institution that can remove a president according to the new amendments. So why should you give a president the power, the power to, to play with those names and make sure, okay, let me put my friends in the constitutional committee because they are the only constitutional court because they are the only ones who can dismiss me. So that's a very dangerous, dangerous game that I personally have voted against in the Constitutional Commission, and I will again in, in the Parliament if it comes to a vote, of course. Um, and uh, the other thing has to deal with the, the, what we call the veto right. So far as you know, the President has a veto which can, can be overturned by the Parliament with a 50% plus one majority. The proposal is to increase that majority and to make it uh, 72 votes. That alone is a very dangerous precedent because it makes the president more powerful than the parliament and more powerful than the government. Why? Because a government can be formed with only 61 votes, right? Any law, most of the laws, can be adopted with a simple majority of those who are present, which is only 31 votes. So each and every law that we adopt, or any government that will be in place now or in the future, uh, can adopt anything with only 61 votes, and the president will be the supreme power that can overturn, that can repeal every decision of the government, every decision of the parliament, and taking into account current situation in Kosovo, it's going to be quite hard for a government, future government to have 72 votes to overturn a veto of the president. So you would give this really, really strong power to the president, and the president is one person. Whereas a parliament is, uh, I mean, don't look at the current composition of the parliament, but think of it as an institution. An institution that is comprised of 120 people that are directly elected by the citizens is always more democratic when deciding uh, on a certain issue than just one single person. So it, it, it completely destroys the balance of power, powers in Kosovo institutions if we allow that to happen, to increase the number of votes that are required to overturn mm -hmm. President's veto. Of course, in the US we have two thirds, but that's a presidential system. In Kosovo, you cannot on one hand say that we have a parliamentary system and on the other side make the president the supreme power they can, that can repeal every decision of a government that has been duly formed with 61 votes or decision of the parliament, that is. Yes, I can ask. Mm -hmm. Coming back to the power sharing, we spoke before, is it power sharing is a pattern of democracy. If you could think about, uh, let's say, we spoke about the central level, if you could juxtapose it to the local level and look at this extensive amount of rights recognized to the communities and to the municipalities in Kosovo, uh, would, would you be thinking about Say this dichotomy between a self, a power sharing at the central level, and a, and a self rule at the local level, and how do they, uh, let's say, mm -hmm. come interact? In it's well at the time when most of the legislation uh, that dealt with the rights of local level uh, was adopted, at least the first draft, what we call the Akhtisari laws. I cannot say that uh, people at the local level were very much involved in the process. There, they were quite ignored. Which is, which is bad, uh, because you cannot know how a municipality can be run best if you do not get a couple of mayors around the table and listen to their opinions. Uh, that's why later on we had to change quite many of those laws. Uh, I was present myself in many of these discussions when uh, there is quite a clash between the central government and the local government over competencies. Yeah, even there were big fights about competencies over garbage, trust me. Uh, over who would have the power to manage the city garbage uh, because they were trying to centralize it and then the local government was trying to keep it for itself or water supply powers. Uh, there is also uh, quite a challenge because most of the legislation that is coming to the parliament, uh, especially that coming from the Ministry of Trade and Industry, 
which deals with trade inspectorates and all these. These used to be uh, quite many of them competences belonging to the municipalities. But now with, uh, the ministry is trying to get those competences back to the center, central government. Uh, that in itself goes against principles, principles of self-government, especially uh, conventions on self-government, Council of Europe conventions, which are directly applicable in Kosovo. We've been trying, I mean, many of us have been trying to speak against it because it doesn't do well to the functioning of democracy. Uh, we should try to decentralize lots of the powers, not send them back to the central level. Uh, but there, there are clashes of competences, uh, and there continues to be quite a fight between the central level government and the local level, level government. Uh, of course, as you may know, in 2007, we've changed the system into having mayors rather than just uh, presidents of the local council. The mayors now have more competences than they used to because they are directly elected by the people. Every single time when you have a process where the people cast their votes to choose one person, then that person normally has more powers than uh, if he had been chosen by a council or an assembly or a parliament. The same with the president. If the president is chosen by the people, normally in most countries it has more powers than if he or she is chosen by the parliament. Please, thank you. Yeah, my question is, so why is a parliamentary system chosen as the structure of the government? Uh, if you read Kosovo's constitution, it never says that Kosovo has a parliamentary system. It's simply Article uh, 2, if I'm not mistaken, says Kosovo is a democratic republic. So it chooses republic, but not parliamentary or semi-presidential or presidential. Um, although most people refer to it as a parliamentary system, especially parliamentarians, because they love to think they are more important, Checking at the current institution and how power is shared, it goes towards semi-presidential. Because the president has some executive powers, it has the veto power, as I said, it leads foreign policy, it has the power to initiate legislation, to propose bills, it has the power to return legislation, it has the power to appoint all judges and prosecutors in the judiciary, these are quite stronger powers if we compare them to pure parliamentary systems where the president is simply, simply a ceremonial figure, a person that participates in giving medals and honors, but that's about it. So in the current constitution, it's not purely parliamentary, although most people refer to it. The reason why the drafters and the then political powers insisted in, in having mostly a parliamentary system was because there is this general view among European countries especially that if you have a country under transition, you have to make sure that for about 10 to 20 years the powers belong to a parliament rather than, as I said, a single person. Because a single person very easily can either become a mafia or be a mafia uh, and abuse the system very easily. Whereas when you put the power in a body with 120 people, it's more democratic and it helps uh, the development in the governance system of a country. So that's the main reason, because uh, <coughs> people thought that it's, it's better for the health of the state building process to, to have a parliamentary system for a while, at least for 10, 15 years, but we'll see what happens afterwards. If we go with strengthening president's competitions, we might end up with a presidential system very soon. The way it has started, you never know. I have a question in relation to what I asked before, which is, do you think when the amendments, let's say, to the Constitution were made, you said in the beginning that when the Constitution was drafted, it was purely a political agreement? Mostly. Mostly. Okay. Yeah. Not, yeah. Because yeah. there was a fourth factor, which was the drafter's intention, but it was the least important. When the amendments were made, the second, mm -hmm. it, was a, it was the first time that amendments were being made, right? Yeah, the About one the on the presidential system, it was the very first time. Do you think there was... It was again the same situation as when it was drafted, just mainly a political agreement, or was it more? Was there more involvement, let's say, from the civil society or uh, discussion there was, groups? There was more. There was there was more, more uh, interest. Yes, there was more because the constitutional committee again had public discussions in each and every municipality, in universities. We were here discussing with students on those uh, proposed amendments. Uh, and the civil society was involved in each and every working group, so they had the right to propose their own amendments. 
to give their own opinions. Uh, I would say that about 80% of the amendments involved a simple professional view of the members. Most, most of the members were constitutional law professors uh, this time, not just political representatives that had never dealt with constitutional law before. This time, this time it was lawyers, constitutional experts, and each member of parliament had the right to propose another expert, non-political, non-partisan, uh, but that expert had to be a constitutional law expert. So there was lots of expertise in the committee. We've had experts from the United States, people who have dealt with constitutional law from Europe. So it was mostly a professional exercise rather than political influence, about 80%. But then the 20% which was political was the, the influence that stalled this entire process. So it all ended up in the, in the, <coughs> the hands okay. of politics again after, after all. There are, of course, just two or three things there that are purely political, but because of those, you cannot move on to the process with the rest of the amendments. Do we have any more questions? No? Okay. Thank you.